you're cursed you've got demons and it's probably from the cult Mm. that you experienced you know opening the door for satan actually had a pastor come specially to exorcise me i'm just picturing like someone screaming at you maybe in a different language holy water like it wasn't that extreme yeah it, it, definitely he went like full the exorcism of Emily Rose yeah for sure my boyfriend at the time was there to help like hold me down and at the end he told me I've successfully got all the demons out <laughs> I was doing this like elaborate kind of like pulling a snake out of my mouth and uh-huh. it was so insane Hey, my name is Shalise Ansola, and this is Cults to Consciousness, where we discuss leaving high demand religions or organizations and finding healing and independence through awareness and true individual sovereignty. If you're only listening, head on over to my YouTube page to see our faces at Cults to Consciousness, where you can join in on the conversation. It means so much that you comment and leave words of encouragement for our guests. It's just really nice to read those, and it's nice for our guests too. So today's guest, you have seen her once before and back by popular demand. She was part of the JMS cult. It's a Korean cult, and the leader of that cult is currently on trial to go back to prison for a lot of horrible things that we're not going to say due to the YouTube algorithm. (laughs) So you can definitely go back and watch that. But everyone was asking about her past, which I think really informs the way that she saw this next cult and why she may have been more vulnerable to get involved in the JMS cult. So welcome back to the show, Liz. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's lovely to be back, Shalise. And I just wanted to say thanks to everyone who was so encouraging. I read through the comments on YouTube and um, on the video, and it was it was just so um, affirming to read the the lovely responses that everyone had. You have a, a wonderful crowd. Oh, so, thank yeah. you. Yeah, we had some incredible words of encouragement, and I actually wanted to read a couple of those comments now just to kind of kick off this episode from 101 Kalamazoo. This is one of my favorite episodes yet. She is incredible and so well-spoken and smart. I couldn't agree more. And then we have one here from M.A. Sperry, 3424. Kudos to Liz and her mom for having the courage to fight against this malevolent force. Again, this highlights how dangerous and destructive these cults and essentially all religions are. Much damage has been done in the guise of holiness. Mm. Oh, so much damage in the name of God. It's just really upsetting. And also, your mom is amazing, and everyone has so many nice things to say about your mom. For those who haven't seen the first video, I just have to say, her mom, almost single-handedly, with the help of a deprogrammer, got Liz out of this incredibly dangerous cult. And if she would have stayed in any longer, once this uh, cult leader was out of prison, she could have become a victim of something very serious. So her mother (laughs) hired this deprogrammer, Rick Allen Ross, and basically had this intervention with her and got her out. And so we've been trying to get mom on the show, but she's a little shy, right? (laughs) She's camera shy, but I did read all the lovely comments for her in the YouTube video. And she, I think she, you know, she felt very blessed by those comments. So if yeah, I didn't use that word. Yeah, your mom is so sweet. <laughs> yeah, she she really appreciated that. Like she she obviously is very, she's a very humble person. She was like, oh no, I don't deserve that. I just did what I, I just did what I had to. But um, I don't think there's many parents who, who would have done something like that um, to the extent that she did. So I I was very lucky. But thank you, everyone, for being so kind. Yeah, I agree. What she did was incredible. And I kind of got to see her on FaceTime for like a brief second and say, hi, mom, you're amazing. And she ran away. (laughs) Yeah, she's like, oh, hello, yes. (laughs) <laughs> she's so sweet which I totally understand like being on camera is tricky and it's scary and it's a lot of things and so we don't blame her at all for not wanting to come on but we just have to thank her from afar <laughs> I'll pass it all on yes and one more comment that I wanted to read from must avoid scurvy Even though the theme of the video is awful, I enjoyed really much being able to listen to two amazing, kind, and beautiful women talking about regaining confidence and self-trust. Very, very sweet. 
And then they said, can we have another video with Liz? Please, Shalise. <laughs> I love your channel. Thank you for the work you're doing and, and for sharing it with us. Well, wish granted. <laughs> Here we are. Yeah. We are doing a second <laughs> episode where we are going to dive into her Pentecostal past. And this is the first time that we've really gone into Pentecostal. And I have to admit, I don't know much about it. In fact, I would say close to zero about being Pentecostal. So I think, Liz, um, based on our conversations off camera, you're like, well, there's certainly some things that I could go into and talk about. And not to say that being Pentecostal means it's a cult, but just like with any religion, there are a lot of culty aspects. And I think it's smart when we know all the red flags, we can better take care of ourselves and just be aware of what's going on. So with that... Would you be able to give us just like an overview of who they are, what they believe, um, just so we all are on the same page? Yes. Uh, so Pentecostalism is a branch of Christianity, so um, Protestant Christianity as opposed to Catholicism. Um, so it falls under the same umbrella as um, Anglicans, Assemblies of God, Baptist, all those different Christian denominations, which often there's a lot of infighting between them. Pentecostalism, I mean, they all sort of hold the same kind of core beliefs, Jesus as the Messiah, um, the Son of God, and they don't sort of worship Mary or, or any of the saints. It's more just focused on the Holy Trinity. But Pentecostalism focuses more on uh, the anoint anointing of the Holy Spirit. So um, there's a lot of emphasis on, especially because of the later books of the New Testament, which did focus on, I think it was, was it in Paul or something? Like, like everyone was anointed with the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues um, after Jesus had gone up to heaven. Uh, that anointing of kind of the Spirit had been passed from him to his followers, according to the Bible. And so that was a very core belief that's held in Pentecostalism and the kind of environment that I grew up in was very focused on speaking in tongues, mm. um, casting out demons, um, you know, being anointed by the Holy Spirit in any way, shape or form, following, you know, the, the voice of God in your head, hearing from God, um, supernatural experiences, all that sort of thing. Uh, so it was very focused on the supernatural. And so... Um, I remember, you know, growing up in church and, and we would have every single service, there would be an altar call and everyone who wanted to go up the front and get prayer for whatever it might have been, um, would a lot of them would end up at the end of the service um, passed out on the floor at the front. Um, so people would be shaking, you know, they'd be screaming, they'd be having what looked like a seizure, um, they'd be praying in tongues and often they, you know, it was the hand on the head kind of Benny Hinn style. Um, if you know of Benny Hinn, I don't know if you... I don't. Have you heard of him? Okay. He's like a... He was um, on American television for a very long time as a Pentecostal preacher and he'd put his hand on people's heads and they just fall down. Oh. Yeah. And so it's interesting looking back, I suppose, to think of those dynamics and I don't, I don't personally believe that that was anointing of the Holy Spirit. I think it was... Um, more of a, um, I guess, a psychological effect of, you know, uh, influence and suggestibility and the power of suggestion when you get together as a group um, and the power of suggestion when you're surrounded by people doing those things. Uh, feeling anointed is more of a, a group psychology experience than it is a heavenly experience. Mm. Um, but it feels very real at the time. And I remember even as a child falling down at the front and Part of me was like, no, I'm not doing this, but I, you know, it, it's hard to, <laughs> it's hard to realize, I guess, well, you believe it's real at the time. I, I think <laughs> I'm not explaining myself very well, I think, because that's such a core cool part of how I grew up, but it's hard to tease apart the aspects and get kind of that um, perspective on it that I have on the cult because it was, it was just my childhood. It was just how I grew up, which right. I know you understand because you grew up in Mormonism. And yeah, um, I don't think that the church was necessarily a cult, but like you accurately identified, it had very cult like aspects. Well, I think you're doing a great job, by the way. Oh, great. And <laughs> Thanks, Julie. <laughs> and it sounds like this is an atmosphere that very heavily relies on fear. Is that true? 
Yes, absolutely. And, and that's a really astute point. Um, a lot of it was, was fear based and fear driven. Now, of course, we wouldn't admit to that in the church. Um, and the church will never admit to that. They, they say it's based on love. Obviously, mm. you know, the love of God, um, the gra- gratitude that you have towards Jesus. But at the end of the day, what keeps people in is the fear of hell, the fear of retribution and the fear of, um, you know, falling away. Right. Because there are a lot of vengeful, wrathful verses in the Bible, you know, where God is speaking about what happens if you, if you leave or abandon him. And I remember even as a child being terrified of kind of doing the wrong thing or, or committing an unforgivable sin. And I remember there was a sermon about it one time and I must have been about five or six and it scared me so much that I <laughs> literally like cried myself to sleep multiple mm-hmm. nights because I, I, you know, it was I was so terrified. There was this idea that you could commit an unforgivable sin and once you do that, that's it. And I thought, and it was a sin that you commit inside your own head. It was a sin that you could, it was something about like blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. Mm. And I just remember being like, I could, I could do that without even thinking about it. I could do it by accident. You know, I could like, I was like, I, I can't, couldn't comprehend the idea in my little brain of going to hell forever by having just said one wrong thing. And that really kind of stuck with me. And I was pretty inconsolable after that um, for a little while. And I think that's, yeah, that was a pretty early childhood experience that made an impression on me. Um, And I took everything very much to heart because the people around me did. Um, And there was such a big sense of like how you get close to God, the importance of it, the importance of prayer, the importance of being, uh, I guess, afraid of the spiritual world, being afraid of the effect of Satan, um, we're constantly in this kind of spiritual warfare where we're fighting against Satan. And I honestly think like <laughs> the leaders in the church kind of got off on that. Like it was, it was this idea that you've got this giant, like this crazy spiritual battle that's going on and you're a soldier mm-hmm. and you know, you've got to fight against the enemy. And that was, <laughs> that was something that we really talked about a lot. And I remember even as a kid as well, being given books about people who said they'd gone to hell they'd had some kind of experience where jesus had taken them to hell what and they'd experienced like you know them being in a spirit body in hell and how incredibly traumatic hell was um like just different forms of torture um just horrific horrific terrifying book to read multiple books there were and um and we'd read through those to be like see how's real someone went there jesus took them there and yeah and then how is that how is that not instilling phobias and fear in people's minds you know yeah. when you're talking about that being the cause for keeping the faith that's a pretty it's a pretty strong cause like that is absolutely terrifying mm. and i can just imagine that fear as a child because you're just trying to figure out how the world works. And if they're telling you that this is reality, you're going to believe it just the same way that a child believes in Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny or the Tooth Fairy. But this is real. This is torture. This is like rated R movie stuff that you're telling to children. And that's really scary when you tell them that demons are a real thing. (laughs) It's not no such thing as monsters in the closet there are such things as demons in the closet. Like that's so scary. Do you remember thinking about the the way that these demons were a tangible force? Did you find yourself looking for them or watching out for them? Yeah, definitely. Um, I remember seeing or thinking I saw some kind of figure moving into my brother's room as a child and no one was in there. I went and checked it out and mum was like, oh, that must have been something spiritual and she went and you know she'd pray over the room and cast the demons out and that was a pretty common occurrence our parents like casting demons out of the house and spiritual warfare spiritual prayers like all the time we'd we'd go to um uh uh not just church on the weekend but we had like a midweek kind of like bible study group where all these families would get together and pray and sing songs and so it was was pretty like there were a lot of cult-like aspects to it um and yes, we were all encouraged to very much try and like think, you know, spiritually and kind of have that 
almost like third eye open, although that's not how they referred to it, but uh, people in the church who claimed that they could see the spirit world um, or, you know, had that kind of sense um, were often very revered in the church. Mm. Um, and looking back with the understanding I have now, I sort of think that's a bit psychotic, isn't it? Like for someone, obviously these people weren't hearing from God and they weren't seeing demons or angels in, in my mind, of course, um, it's my opinion. But with that in mind, what the fuck were they doing? Like <laughs> just making shit up, uh, <laughs> you know? And, but I think that's really common, like, and it's easy to do. And I don't, I don't necessarily presume that they were completely making shit up. They might have. It's very easy. And I don't know whether you can relate to this, Shalice, but I found it growing up very easy to think, oh, I've heard from God, when actually it's just the voice in your own head that mm-hmm. is interpreting things according to the framework that you have been conditioned to believe in. And you're coming up with your own ideas and, and you might have a, a quite a clear thought and think, oh, that must be God speaking to me. And it's not. Um, right. Did you ever feel like, was there suggestion like that in the Mormon church or was it? Yeah. Yeah, there was. And it was, it was seen as the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost talking to you. Yeah. And so anytime you didn't get warm and fuzzy feelings, it's because the spirit had left you, which meant you must be doing something wow. wrong. So wow. they kind of monopolized your emotions in that way. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the thing about the the psychics and the mediums and everything, I feel like it's kind of tricky because I'm also not one mm. to say that a spirit world doesn't exist, but yes. what I don't yes. like is when people are using these visions or whatever it is and weaponizing it against people with fear. Absolutely. Like if you want to say Absolutely. you saw a ghost, then cool. But to say I saw a ghost in your house and you have to either pay me to come and like do an exorcism <laughs> or or if you don't have me come over and bless it in the name of God, your family is going to be possessed by demons. Like that's oh. where I don't agree with it. And that it's makes me upset. Yeah, it's manipulation absolutely. and fear tactics. It absolutely is. Yes. And it is a form of abuse, like that spiritual abuse right mm-hmm. there. I agree with you in the sense that I don't want to write off, um, you know, the idea of a God or a spirit world in general. Um, mm-hmm. And I think it's important, at least for myself personally, as an ex-cult member, an ex-religious, ex-fundamentalist Christian, uh, to really be able to um, live in the world of grace where I don't know exactly what exists, what's out there, um, whether there's a spiritual world, whether there isn't, whether it's something that we sort of have a good idea of or whether it's something completely different from what we could possibly conceptualise. And that's fine because I'd mm. rather live curious and open um, than do the exact same thing that I did in religion, which is have this black and white sense of the world. I know what's true, you don't. And if someone disagrees right. with me, then they're automatically wrong and I'm right. I don't think that's a healthy way to think. And I think that's how we were taught to think in the church. So, uh, yeah, I don't want to write off the idea of a spiritual world, but what I do object to is the idea that the only reality that is valid is the one that um, – exists within Christianity or exists right. within a particular religion because if your faith is based on or your beliefs are ba- based on faith and not sight, as it says in the Bible, we believe by faith and not by sight, you're believing in something that is intangible inherently by virtue of that fact. If you've got another religion that believes in something based on faith and not sight, that belief is absolutely just as valid and by that argument just as real right. as the belief that you hold. And so, you know, I think it's less to do with, you know, being opposed to any kind of spirituality and more to do with exactly what you said, which is the idea that we are using and weaponizing spirituality as a means of control and not just by, yeah. by externally controlling people, but a means of actually getting inside their brain and almost like implanting programs in their brain mm-hmm. to interpret things in a way that makes them cling more to the church, be more dependent on the church, be more dependent on, you know, obeying the church. Um, that's absolutely what I object to. And I think that's kind of what you were saying as well. So I, all that to say, I agree. 
Um, yeah, and it is hard to pull apart those dynamics, you know, because I, I wouldn't say, you know, the Christian church is inherently evil, but I think there are a lot of evil aspects. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree with that, which is why we just try and shed light on those different things so that people can see it more clearly. Because when you are born and raised in something like that and it is your reality, it's really hard to question that magical thinking because that's just how you were raised. That's how it was for me anyway when I grew up believing certain things about Mormonism, which if you've been following my channel, you know there's a lot of very interesting beliefs. And I was just like, yep, that's how it is. That's the way <laughs> that's the way life is. Yeah. And I just didn't question it because that's how I was raised. Yes. Hundred percent. You have no other framework to use to perceive the world through. So until you leave, and that's a whole other difficult experience in and of itself, creating a new framework that, you know, is based on critical thought. But without that, you know, you have no other way of interpreting the way you see the world other than the doctrine that you've been programmed with. So, yeah, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. So speaking of your childhood and your past, how invested were you in the doctrine? Would you say that you were the type who was very fervent and very um, wanting to learn more? Because it seems like you were a very dedicated person in JMS once you left Pentecostal church. So was it the same growing up for you? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, and like I said, I think in the last podcast, my personality is very much like if I'm invested in something or I believe in something or I'm passionate about something, then I'll put everything into it. And I think that's, you know, it can be a good quality, but I needed to learn to temper it with critical thought. But I didn't have access to that when I was growing up. I wasn't, I was completely terrified to think in any other way mm -hmm. than faith in what I've been taught because that's a sin. So I did throw myself into it and, you know, that was the environment that we were all in as well. And I didn't see that there was any choice mm. uh, because I remember the particular Bible verse being quoted again and again, which was um, something about how if you're lukewarm, God says he'll spit you out of his mouth. So you're either hot or cold, mm. um, which to me meant and to the way that it was interpreted in church meant, you know, you're either against me or you're for me and there's no in between you can't be kind of halfway there you can't be lu lukewarm you've got to be completely invested heart body mind soul and so I did take that to heart because I was fucking terrified of going to hell right um and and incurring God's wrath even though he's supposed to be a loving God uh the the wrath of God was very much emphasized in the church as well um and I also remember, you know, martyrdom being kind of glorified. Mm -hmm. So they'd constantly talk about, you know, how, how wonderful Christian martyrs were, how there were Christian martyrs overseas, you know, in countries where they're persecuted for their faith and, you know, the, the best, you know, the most um, honorific thing you can do for God is to be martyred. And so, uh, you know, as a kid, you'd sort of fantasize about, yeah, yeah, I'd be martyred for God. I'd, I'd, I'd gladly do that you know that's the greatest honor and of course it was never going to happen to me I mean we live in Australia for goodness <laughs> sakes but um and we're very lucky <laughs> but you'd, you'd sort of fantasize about that because you'd think that's the that's the ultimate you know sign of of love giving my life and so by virtue of that fact of course you got to do everything alive that you can to commit yourself to to God and to show him that you're devoted yeah um if not martyrdom you know it was it was a very very um, cult like kind of religion, um, yeah. Yeah. So, what did your devotion look like on a day to day basis? What was the fabric of your daily life as far as bringing church and God into it? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I because again, it wasn't it wasn't a cult in the sense that there wasn't that element of extreme control. We were allowed to access other information. Um, even if it was somewhat restricted, you know, we were allowed to ask questions. It wasn't encouraged, but, you know, we weren't going to get in trouble. Mm -hmm. um, and so my life wasn't nearly as um, strict or devoted or controlled as what it was in the cult when there was no room for anything else. But growing up, it would just mean, you know, church on every holiday and every Sunday, um, volunteering in church when we could, uh, going to prayer meetings sometimes. My parents would 
take me and my two brothers to prayer meetings that happened went late into the night. So they'd bring sleeping bags for us and board games or puzzles and we'd sit in the back while everyone prayed in tongues for hours up the front. Um, and, you know, we'd fall asleep and eventually they'd get us up at, you know, whatever time it was that they finished late at night or early in the morning and bundle us up and drive home. Uh, and then we had home group, which was a bunch of different families getting together with all their kids and we'd all have dinner together um, every week. And we'd sort of do a potluck or we'd bring a meal and someone else would bring a meal. And it's actually quite lovely. Um and I think that's one of the thing that things that people are drawn to in churches in general is that sense of community and, mm-hmm. you know, everyone's looking out for each other and, um, yeah, like it was, it was good. And then as I got older, I did, um, venture out of the church that I was raised in and I sought a new church, um, with my, with my friends at the time. And I was about probably 15 or 16. I thought I've grown up enough to to find my own church, and so I did start looking with. And we found um, a nice, seemingly nice local church, and kind of settled down there as people in our late teens, and um, established roots there. And and that to me was kind of me exercising my independence, mm-hmm. you know, um, and choosing to do something aside from my family. And they encouraged and supported that. So that was good. You know, it wasn't a cult in that aspect as well. You can move churches as long as you stay in the faith. Mm. But, yeah, that church turned out to be a not, not, not a safe space. And looking back, I don't think that the one that I went to originally was necessarily a safe space either, but I had nothing to compare it to, you know. Right. Um I think my brothers and I are all traumatised to a degree by the fear tactics that they used and my parents would echo that because they're incredibly, incredibly committed. Um, but I also don't think that's a unique experience. I think that's pretty universal to going to church, really. Wow. Can you remember anything specific, like a specific instance that stands out to you in that part of your teen years? As a teenager, uh, I sort of remember that I left the church um, that my parents went to because young people didn't really seem to matter at that point in time. They didn't have really like a anything for young people to go to or attend. And so moving churches um, with two of my friends, uh, we tried to go somewhere where youth were more appreciated and welcomed and also nurtured. And we were, but at the same time, there were quite controlling aspects. So when I was sort of six, 15, 16, 17 at the new church that I went to with my two friends, we obviously were expected to volunteer um, and to do that for free, it's volunteering. And while I did do that, not all volunteering was equal. So uh, my friend had a beautiful singing voice and she was asked to be in the worship team and I did not. <laughs> so I was told to, you know, do um, chip and stretch. And I, and I happily did it. But there was definite favoritism that was practiced. And this was a sort of like the celebrity culture that Pentecostalism buys into a lot, which is um, you've got this hierarchy and almost like you're these glorified people on stage. And then you've got the regular members. And that happens in places like Hillsong. Mm. Um, and, yeah, I remember sort of feeling like, yeah, you're just you're volunteering and you are spending all your spare time trying to help and do it out of the goodness of your heart. But volunteering, um, yeah, like I said, it's not all equal. So the girl who was singing at the front, she would get praise heaped on her, always invited over to the pastor's house, you know, best friends with the pastor's daughter and me and my other friend were very much pushed to the side and, you know, I remember one specific instance where you know, we all turned 18, um, a few months apart and, um, me and my first friend, we had our birthdays and I think I got a key ring from the pastor. I mean, this is a silly example, but I don't have a better one, um, <laughs> to kind of explain it in a tangible way. I got a key ring and then, um, it was, yeah. And then, and they came to my birthday party and everything. And then I remember my friend had, uh, I had her birthday and what they did was they stood her up the front of the church and they planted 18 people in the audience with roses and they all one by one came up and passed her a rose and you're the most amazing person and we love you so much and you know and we'd all come together Mm -hmm. um and there was 
yeah, there was like a distinct amount of favoritism and kind of at the time as well, I was struggling with an eating disorder for the first time. And I just remember not receiving any care or attention for that at all. Like I think the pastor, pastor's wife met with me once and um, she sort of said, oh, yeah, like I, I understand you're depressed and you you know, you've got an eating disorder. Well, let me tell you, I was much worse when I was younger. You'll be fine. And and oh, um, no. and that was kind of it. That was the extent of the care. Whereas they invested everything into our other friend who could sing, everything. Like she was, she was the golden child. Um, and so I think that was hard um, in the sense that I didn't feel like I was supported or loved in that community. And at the same time, the friends that I did have, this particular friend, the singer, she was actually quite an abusive person mm-hmm. emotionally. And for some reason, because I'd known her in the context of church, that was always okay. And so I think being in that vulnerable position where I was unwell and I was receiving pretty nasty treatment or at least neglectful treatment in the church where I was trying to seek help and community and love and care and having a friend who who was um, quite emotionally abusive and I'd grown up with her since age two. So, I, you know, I'd never knew anything different there either. When I started to receive love and care from um, the JMS cult, mm-hmm. members of the cult, I, I was like, wow, I didn't, I didn't realize that, you know, I could be made to feel so loved or appreciated. And of course that changed once I was brainwashed, but I think that was a really powerful thing. It was a really powerful tool that they used at the time because, I had been feeling so invisible and neglected in church. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's not a unique experience either. Many people feel that way. Um, religion was never designed to mesh with capitalism. And when you have churches that begin to act like businesses, which is quite common in Pentecostalism, um, followers turn into resources to be exploited. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you are going to invest your resources into something that is going to pull in more people um, versus something that isn't because people are resources. And then, you know, capitalism itself wasn't designed to prevent harm. Capitalism was designed to make as much money as possible. So I think just the meshing of those two is really where, uh, in my experience, the church becomes destructive and abusive. And there are a lot of other ways that the church can be destructive and abusive. But I, I think especially in my later teens and once I came out of the cult, my experience was with churches that did act like money-making machines. Yeah. Not, um, yeah, they weren't existing for goodwill. <laughs> yeah. And I guess I never put that together in such a way that you just did, which I love that you did that because it's so true. Church is meant to be intimate and spiritual, but then when you add in things like quotas and money and hierarchy where the top is just rolling in money and the bottom has no money, but they're giving it to the church, it can be incredibly damaging. There's a lot of people who talk about going on Mormon missions, and that's the moment where they realize it's not the church that they thought they belonged to when their leaders are telling Mm -hmm. them, if you don't baptize a certain amount of people by the end of the month, you're not doing it right, and you like, we need to get numbers in, Mm -hmm. you have to report everything to us. So... Yeah, it just doesn't it doesn't mix and wow. it leaves people feeling really disjointed where they thought that they were doing something good and then it turns out they're just helping this corporation yeah. make more money. So I love so much yeah. that we're doing this episode because it just adds so much context to your story with the JMS cult. And as you're talking, I'm like, yep, oh, that makes sense. Oh, that makes <laughs> sense because yeah. You weren't feeling loved and accepted, and then they just love bombed you, yeah. this JMS group. And maybe we can just give like a super, super quick rundown of what you went through, and then people who want to hear the full story can go and listen to the, your, your other episode. Yeah, basically, um, I was approached by um, a couple of women in a cult at different times, and the upshoot of it was that I ended up um, being brainwashed into a destructive cult called JMS. Um, the leader currently is on trial or he's he's awaiting the conviction. Um, uh, he's a serial rapist, previously convicted, um, and we're hoping to put him in jail forever. But I was in that cult for nearly two years. 
Uh, and I, I nearly lost my life in that cult. And the way I escaped was I ended up in hospital and was professionally deprogrammed. So, um, lucky to be alive. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, definitely worth, worth listening to that episode if you're curious. Yeah, definitely. And also to add to, that description, you were specifically chosen to be one of thousands of spiritual brides for the leader. And oh, yeah. that yeah, was another that way. <laughs> that's another way that they made you feel really special and chosen and, yes, you know, angelic, I guess you could call it. You're supposed to be another thing we didn't mention, I don't think, is that the leader thinks that he is, or at least he tells people that he is Jesus returned. So he is the Messiah. So Correct. if you're chosen to become one of his brides, you basically live a life like a nun and you are to only be with him. You are married to the Messiah. So it's very twisted and it gets it gets really uncomfortable and hard to listen to all these women's stories who talk about the abuses um, in the name of God. And there are documentaries. We'll put them in the description box if you want to also read more, watch more about this cult, you can. And then obviously watch our other episode. So we had to bring that in because the next part of your story is once you're out of the cult, where do you turn to now that you have this huge spiritual void? Yeah. So I, I came out of this cult like very unwell. Um, I was pretty much, I was emaciated. Um, I was very weak, I was fragile, and I had just lost, you know, my entire belief system. I, I had the thing that I believed in so strongly that I'd been brainwashed to believe that I based my entire life around that I would have died for kind of crumble. Um, and that was a really hard thing to contend with on its own. And I spent the next year or so almost in a state of shock, I think, um, because, yeah, I just, I <laughs> I think because, you know, I hadn't had time to sort of slowly leave to start questioning yeah. and then to work my way out. This was a deep programming. It was done in three days and everything, you know, everything crumbled in three days. And so um, I remember, like, I actually, well, I don't remember a lot of the first year because I spent a lot of it pretty dissociated. Mm. I remember sort of going into a room and kind of just standing there and zoning out. And then, you know, two hours later, I'd be like, where did that time go? Wow. I was really, really not well. And I was quite suicidal at that time as well um, because I had lost everything and I didn't come out with anything and, and they'd made me stop studying. And so I had no degree, no money, nothing. I didn't even have my health. I had osteoporosis and I was emaciated. So <sighs> I, and I didn't have friends. Um, I like all the friends and family that I had, I was told to cut off. And, uh, and I remember when I got out of hospital and was deprogrammed, um, the friends that I had had in the church, uh, knew that I had come out of hospital um, and that I was very unwell and that I'd come out of the cult. But um, the church that I was previously with and those friends that I'd had for my whole life um, did not reach out to me, didn't extend any any kind of care or love. Um, I think it was kind of once I had left them for another church, um, that, was, that was sort of it mm -hmm. um, and I didn't deserve, you know, <laughs> didn't deserve any any follow-up or any attention after that. So it might have been that they didn't fully understand what I'd gone through. Um, it might have been that they didn't know what to say um, or how to address what had happened, uh, but that was incredibly uh, painful, you know, having the friends that I'd had my entire life not even bother to check if I was okay Yeah. Um, when I'd nearly died. So in the, the context of that meant that I really felt I had, I had nothing. And I remember sort of thinking, and it was excruciatingly painful and lonely. And I remember having a moment thinking if the thing that I believed in so strongly, this cult, this man, you know, this doctrine, I believed in that with my entire life and with everything that I had. And so if that could have been false, if I could have been so convinced it was true, but it wasn't, what if none of it's true? You know, like what yeah. if God isn't real? Or what if uh, what if the religion that I grew up in is false as well? 
And I had that thought and then immediately I was like, "Mm -mm, can't cope with that. I cannot, I cannot cope with not only losing. It's too much. It's too much all at once. And I remember thinking very clearly, like if I lost my faith in God and everything that I've grown up with, then I don't, I don't know how to live. I don't know if I want to live anymore. Like it was just, it was too hard. I couldn't let go of it. And I also needed some kind of sense that um, there would be, I don't know, like some kind of healing or atonement or that that this was all part of a a bigger mission or, you know, that that sense that I, I really needed some kind of belief in some sort of direction or redemption of what I'd just gone through. And if I decided to let go of my faith entirely, then there was none of that for me. Right. It was all, it was all up to me. And, uh, I'd never thought like that once in my life. It was always God's story, God's plan. And so I chose to cling to my belief in God and I clung to it with literally everything I had and to the point that I was like, okay, I need to go to Bible college. So I took a year off to heal and try and recover and, and learn. And then I, I went to Bible college. So I moved to Sydney and went to a mega church Bible college wow. up there. And, uh, as I said in the last, uh, in the last interview, I would not recommend it to anyone. <laughs> it was a terrible decision. Um, and, but it's the best one I knew how to make at the time, which was to cling to God again, yeah. you know, to try and try everything, um, to sort of get close to God and to heal myself. And I didn't know any direction to run to except towards God. So at that point, did you continue to cling to Pentecostalism or were you kind of, I don't know, shopping around other Christian denominations? Um, Pentecostalism, I think it it felt sort of safer to go back to what I knew, Mm -hmm. um, which was Pentecostalism. Um, That said, it never really was the safest of spaces for me, but again, I didn't know any different. Um, I certainly didn't want to try anything new. I just wanted, you know, familiarity and care and um for someone to maybe listen to my to me and to sort of help me heal help me understand what had happened to me and all I knew was to get that through the church community I had tried to go to therapists as well but none of them really got what I was going through um, or understood what that kind of coercion looked like and, and what that kind of religious abuse looked like so yeah going to bible college pentecostal it was what I knew. And I think it was important for me to go, though I would never do it again. Uh, it was really important for me to go because I was able to realize, especially after having come out of a cult and then being deprogrammed, studied what cult dynamics look like and what coercion looks like, and then work with Rick Ross a couple of times to also deprogram people. And just being exposed to all of that meant that when I went to Bible college, um, I mean, I went for healing, but <laughs> I couldn't help but see those same dynamics of coercion, manipulation, um, and, you know, harm uh, being perpetrated in, in the Christian church as well. Mm. And the power of suggestion being exercised to get people to give of themselves, of their resources, of whatever. There were so many elements of cult-like dynamics, though I wouldn't say it was an actual cult. Um, I couldn't help but see those dynamics really loud and clear. And that was, in a way, it was re-traumatizing um, mm. because I was almost like immersing myself again in in um, a coercive control dynamic and um, trying to make myself like it. <laughs> um, but I didn't know how to do anything else all I knew was you serve God with everything you have and and this is how I heal I also didn't realize when I came to Bible college that it's not where you go when you want to heal it's where you go when you want to get you know thrown into the fire and kind of um you know I guess tested so that you can be worthy of perhaps becoming a pastor and Mm -hmm. I had no interest in becoming a pastor or anything of that sort I just wanted to understand where I'd gone wrong and to heal my relationship with God um, and to try and hear from him. And 
I'd gone for redemption as well. Um, and I remember, you know, a couple of pastors saying, you need to repent if I believing anyone else could be the Messiah other than Jesus. And, and, you know, so I did, but like, <laughs> I, I don't think there was an acknowledgement of, Hey, what you went through was really deeply abusive and, and horrible and wrong. Yeah. And, um, that wasn't your fault. Um, instead it was, you chose to believe in a false Messiah and, uh, and good thing you're here now, but you need to repent. And um, everyone was worked incredibly hard. So at Bible college, uh, you know, we we go to church pretty much every day. That we volunteer for free. We're paying thousands of dollars to do this course per year, but we're also volunteering like half of our free time um, to work for the church. And you, people are people are exploited to the nth degree in Bible college, and that's what it's designed for, mm. is my belief. Um, Again, back to that thing where you've got a church operating like a business. It's actually a capitalist machine. It's not, it's not a church people can go to to feel safe and warm and love, but it's a church that simulates that environment very, very effectively in order to, um, influence people to give as much of themselves as they possibly can, uh, with the promise that the more you pour out of yourself, the more God will bless you. But actually, the more you pour out of yourself, the more people at the top, just like in a multi-level marketing scheme, are receiving funds and money and care and, right. you know, all of that sort of thing. People at the top benefit, but people at the bottom, um, you're kind of running off the sweat of an oily rag and a promise. And, and you know, you're told that it's the most noble thing to do, that the culture of exploitation really runs rampant in these sorts of in- institutions. Um And they're disguised nicely by Bible verses that promote, you know, servanthood and and carrying your cross. Um, And there were people in Bible college, though they're paying through the nose, they're they're volunteering so much they barely have time to work. Um, But then they're also told to give all of their liquid funds to the church, you know, and um, to give beyond your tithe. And, you know, that's that's a noble thing to do. Um, And many of these people couldn't even afford to visit their family over Christmas, let alone give away funds. Yeah. Um, but they really do target those sorts of people because they're impressionable, they're suggestible, and they've put themselves there to be, you know, to be used by God, um, which, you know, in this scenario means used for the purposes of this this business. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it really is a culture of exploitation and one of shame too. You know, people are made to feel shame for, you know, sexual sin, for any kind of sin you can imagine, greed, lust, you know, um, laziness, whatever. Yeah. A lot of the sermons are shame-based and um, based around repenting and, you know, turning back to God and, you know, for the silliest of reasons. And a lot of it is based on, yeah, there's something inherently wrong with you and you need to do everything you can to show that you're grateful for being saved. Um, because you don't deserve it. And so the least you can do is give of your life and your funds and your time and attention and love and money and everything else that you have, because that, that nothing compares to being able to go to heaven and being saved, even though you're a dirty sinner. Um, I mean, that's, that's, that's religion. That's Christianity in general. Right. But, um, putting myself in that Bible college environment was exposing myself to the, I suppose the most, um, intense form of that kind of um environment Mm -hmm. and it's certainly not what i needed to heal it was the opposite but it did show me that those dynamics aren't just they don't just exist in cults they exist in religion at large and religion wasn't a safe place for me to be um and i don't know if i would have noticed that if i'd just gone back to church and continued on my life like Mm. yeah yeah i'm glad that you brought that up because A lot of times it's really easy. And actually, you mentioned this in your previous episode, that one of the things that Rick used to deprogram you was to initially show you different cults and be like, see, you can agree that that's ludicrous, right? Oh, yeah, that doesn't make any sense, right? Until eventually he's like, isn't that kind of what your group is doing? Yeah. And so a lot of times you have people that will say, Oh, clearly Mormonism is a cult, but I'm not in a cult. You think I'm in a cult? Mm. And they're unwilling Mm. to draw the parallels and make any comparisons. In fact, very offended that I would even suggest to draw a comparison, which I get because when you start questioning somebody's belief system, 
Usually, if they're so, so, so deep into it, it's questioning their identity and their reality. It's not just questioning what they think about something. It's their entire life. It's very personal. So I always try to tell people, I'm not against the people who are in these cults or these religions. I think that some people are intentionally hurting people, which absolutely I'm not okay with. But most people are just going along with things. They don't really understand the ways it's becoming harmful and it's systems not people it's how they were raised it's part of who they are so when we are talking about these groups we aren't trying to attack people we're trying to attack systems and manipulation tactics and coercive control and all of those things that belong in cults so to bring this around full circle as a child You were told that demons were very real and people were speaking in tongues and falling over and passing out with the spirit. And then you become part of this group where they are so completely controlling of you and they are deciding what you eat, when you eat, and you are basically being groomed for this leader. And then somehow you're able to escape, not somehow, by your amazing mother, you are able to escape this cult. And then you're dropped right back into the fear and the demons and the hell is real. And you told me before we recorded this that they actually tried to perform an exorcism on you. Like, my goodness, Liz, that is a lot to go through. That is a lot for one person. So do you want to talk a little bit about the exorcism if you're comfortable with it? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, Yeah, it is a lot. Thanks for acknowledging that. It's it's, it's a lot. And I think, you know, yeah, it's hard to kind of even summarize all of these elements um, and how re-traumatizing it was. But for the exorcism, so I I had been in Bible college. I think it was my second year in Bible college at that point, and I was really struggling. And I think that was because I was constantly being re-traumatized in this environment where I was forced mm-hmm. to do all of these things that, you know, felt like spiritual abuse all over again. Um And there was a lot of, there was a lot of exorcism stuff going on. Like people would have demons cast out of them on the regular. Um, that that was almost a weekly occurrence. Mm. Uh, and you know, I remember seeing people being exorcised and vomiting green and, you know, bright green and kind of like (laughs) having seizures and not being able to breathe and all these scary things. It was normal. Um, and I, you know, I'd, I'd go and get prayer when, when it was appropriate. But in this particular instance, I had, I had a series of things happen to me, which were really unlucky. And I was like, why do these things keep happening? And the messaging was you're cursed. Um, and you've got, you've got demons and it's probably from the cult Mm. that you experienced, you know, Satan kind of opening the door for Satan. And so I, uh, actually had a pastor come specially to exorcise me. Um, he came to a friend's apartment and my boyfriend at the time was there, um, to help like hold me down and, um, friends at the time were there and, uh, he, yeah, he performed this whole elaborate ceremony. Just, it it was terrifying. It was that kind of weird concept of like, this is probably not a spiritual experience that I had looking back, but at the time it felt like something was happening because I was, I was crying and and feeling a lot of things. But I think that was mostly just emotions from the intensity of the experience that it was. Um, And at the end he told me I've successfully got all the demons out. (laughs) I was doing this like elaborate kind of like pulling a snake out of my mouth. And, Uh you know, I was, it was so, it was so, yeah, it was so insane. Um, But yeah, I was told that I was demon free and nothing unlucky happened to me after that. Um, You know, so it's easy to, you know, for them to argue, well, he got the demons out. I, I certainly don't believe that was what actually took place, but, uh, it was a pretty extreme experience. That's very extreme. Is it like they show in the movies? I'm just picturing like someone screaming at you, maybe in a different language, <laughs> holy water. Like, it was it that extreme? Yeah. yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. It was a lot of screaming and yelling. Um, my head didn't turn 360 degrees, okay. though, and I did not project <laughs> on it. So I didn't hold up my end of the deal. But, uh, yeah, it, it, definitely he went like full, you know, pasta mode. Um, from like the exorcism of Emily Rose. Yeah, for sure. 
Yeah. These things really happen. It's wild. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. Okay. So after that experience, were you on board at this point or were you kind of on your way out? Were you just like, okay, I'll do it because, you know, to appease them? Or did you feel like it worked and you were happy to rid yourself of demons? I think at that point, because I was so beaten down and so scared and so just traumatized that I was willing to believe that that had worked because I would cling to any kind of belief that meant that life wasn't going to be as traumatic and hard as it had been Okay. over the last little while. So yeah, I believed it at the time, but I was sort of on my way out as well. So I, it was a, it was a confusing time. And I, you know, I remember having a number of traumatic incidents in, in Bible college where um, at one point, like the, the head pastor of the whole, you know, global church prayed for me and sort of in a, in a church service and, you know, had said something in his prayer about me having been really hurt and that God was going to heal it. And I just remember kind of crying and thinking, someone tell him or, you know, has he heard mm-hmm. from God or whatever. And then straight after that, down the front, everyone was called to the front, you know, we're, it, the messaging was, we all have to praise God now because, God's going to lift us out of everything, blah, blah, blah. And I had just been reminded of my trauma and I was like, I I'm, I can't just go up and be happy. I can't go up and pretend to be happy. I'm, I'm feeling incredibly heavy right now. And my, my group leader, like in, we had small groups, she pulled me up the front and was like, you have to praise God. You have to praise God. And I just remember being like, I can't, like, I, I do not have that in me right now. Mm-hmm. I can't. And she was like, no, you have to. And I just remember having almost like what felt like a panic attack, like the walls were closing in on me. And I ran outside just crying, hyperventilating. And she fucking ran after me and I got in my car. She's standing there and she's like, you have to go back inside and praise God Jeez. because that's what the pastor has said you have to do. And I was like, she knew exactly what had happened to me. She knew that I was traumatized. She knew that I'd been through hell. But this was the kind of stuff they did all the time, which was put yourself down, put your own experiences down, lay everything down and be happy that you're saved. And I could not do that anymore after what I'd been through because I needed my emotions to be held and acknowledged Mm -hmm. and I needed to feel like I was in a safe space, not in a space where I had to deny myself constantly in order to appease God. Mm -hmm. Um, And so all of those experiences combined, and I remember someone describing it as a shelf where, you know, eventually like if you have an, an instance of cognitive dissonance, you will put that question or whatever it is on the shelf Mm because it's easy just put it on the shelf and continue on your merry way um and then another thing happens you put that on the shelf as well I'm sure you've heard this analogy before yeah but then um eventually you've put so many things on the shelf yeah that the shelf just breaks and and at that point you just can't you can't go back like too much has happened um for you to reasonably believe in this thing anymore reasonably invest your life in it anymore and i think that that was my process of coming out of christianity was i i at some point and i there was no definitive point that i remember it just kind of fell off me and it felt so natural and good and healthy and right and though it was terrifying to kind of then go through the process again of you know, building up a framework of belief and my understanding of the world and my role in it and what it all meant. And I'm still in that process, but it felt healthier than it ever had. Um, I think really the point was um, in my moving back to where I grew up, which was so I grew up in Canberra, moved to Sydney to do Bible college. And then my dad, um, he has um, early onset Alzheimer's. And so um, there was a point that he really started to go downhill mm. And so uh, my family called me and told me this was happening and I was like, I need to go back and be with my father uh, because I don't want him to forget who I am and be living in Sydney and then suddenly come back and he doesn't recognise me. And so I decided to move back to Canberra and so I gave up, you know, my involvement in the church in Sydney. Um, I broke up with my partner at the time who was in the church 
Um, and we were obviously, you know, on the track to getting married and I, I broke that off and I came back and started rebuilding my life in Canberra and I received no care or follow up from anybody, um, in the church that we had been a part of. I, it was just a complete, you know, as soon as I left, it was out of sight, out of mind. Mm. And, and I think that as painful as that was, it was what I needed because I had this breathing space to go, you know what? I don't think these people actually care for me. Yeah. There are a lot of reasons why I don't think this is really true or, or, you know, good or healthy or right. And, and I sort of just focused on myself. I stopped going to church. I realized finally that st- setting foot in a church actually feels re-traumatizing for me. And it brings back a lot of feelings that I, that make me feel very unsafe and, and yeah, just, just yuck. Um, I don't know how else to describe it. Heavy vulnerable. And yeah, uh, I think, you know, I started this journey about five years ago of just becoming more myself and I feel now more myself than ever. And and I'm sure you can relate to the feeling like, you know, of when you come out of religion, the years that you spend deconstructing your faith and reconstructing your own identity, Mm -hmm. they feel like you're doing 10 years in one year, you know, like you become, this vastly different person in a very short period of time because you've you've shed that framework and that skin and you're kind of able to freely build your own sense of self and purpose and meaning. And while that's scary and really fucking hard, it's also incredible and amazing. And uh, and I found much more beautiful friends than I ever have outside of the church than I ever did in. And I found much more purpose and love and joy and fulfilment. Um and yeah, definitely more than enough to fill the Jesus shaped hole in my heart, <laughs> which I will gladly fill with anything but Jesus. <laughs> but yeah, you know, yeah, blasphemous as that is, it's yeah. I think it's so great that you were able to figure out what works for you. And I, I talk about this all the time when people say they're sad that they are losing their community. Um, but you just illustrated so well that it's very conditional love. They will love bomb you to death if you yeah. do what they want you to do. And the second that you step away from that, for the most part, they are conditioned to have conditional love. So I don't even want to blame the people because Absolutely. as soon as you leave the church, they demonize people who have left and say, stay away from them. They'll lead you to hell, whatever yes. it is. So I just... um I love that you found a community outside of a religion that gives you that unconditional love and makes you feel happy and whole. And it's also okay that you don't want another Jesus in the Jesus-shaped hole in your heart, right? It's okay that (laughs) that doesn't resonate with you. And I guess this is an invitation to people who um, are thinking about commenting, oh, it's so sad that she left Jesus altogether. She's clearly not sad. She's very happy and she's healthy and she's living her life to the fullest. And my personal opinion is I don't think Jesus would want her to suffer. And I don't think he, if he is this magical being, would want her to feel depressed and lonely and in this conditional box. And even if it may be different in other denominations. I just feel like if the time comes and and we all get to heaven and Jesus was the way, I feel like he would say, you know what, you did your best and it didn't work for you on earth. How about now? And maybe we can yeah. accept the gospel at that point. But <laughs> I just feel like why put yourself in a prison, in a mental prison, sometimes even, even physical, right? Why put yourself through that because this is the only life we know for sure exists. The only for sure. We for sure know that we're here, right? I mean, hopefully it's not just a simulation, a matrix, but <laughs> we know that we're here. And I just think, why waste that and and live in torment when yeah. you don't have to? If you're not harming anybody, just do what makes you feel good and and do what makes you feel happy. So congratulations on being able to do that. Aww. Thank you. And you put that so beautifully. I agree. And it is, it's like, there are beautiful Christians in Christianity, you know, there are exceptions to the rule. And Mm -hmm. like you said, it's the system, not the people. Um, And there were some beautiful Christians who really, really genuinely showed care and love. And, and I am always thankful for that. 
But I think in the same token, um, there are so many beautiful people who don't believe in God that are showing me the exact same amount of love. It's not exclusive to being in Christ Mm -hmm. at all. Um, And if anything, it gives permission to some people to be more hateful um, because they believe they have a higher truth, you know, and they have an authority from God. And that's dangerous and easy to take advantage of. But I completely agree that, you know, if truly if God was a loving God, Um, If God existed, if there was a heaven, he knows that so many of us who are victims of abuse in the church, not just myself, but many people, I mean, you think about the Catholic church and the the victims of abuse that people, Mm -hmm. like the abuse that people have suffered in there, um, how predatory it was. Are those people the ones who wear the punishment of um, being traumatized and not being able to go to church again? you know, and going to hell because what they were abused and they couldn't set foot in a church anymore because they didn't feel safe. Right. Like if God was a loving God, no, he would, he would understand that you've been hurt and you know, you deserve compassion. Yeah, I agree. And with that beautiful statement, do you have a Linda listen for us? (laughs) Okay. All right. Um, Linda, listen, it does get so much better. And if you have left a religion or a belief system and you're starting to rebuild your um, perception of the world and of yourself and everything else, it gets so much richer and more colourful um, the further you go. Um, so just hang in there. Um, and you have a, a whole community to reach out to. You're not alone. Yes. I love it. Thank you so much for coming back. <laughs> Thanks, um, We're officially friends. You have no choice in the matter. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it won't like be that. the last time we talk. I'm down. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> yes. Thank you for coming on and sharing more of your story. Guys, definitely check out her other episode. I'll link it below in two seconds. But do you have any final thoughts before we go? I don't. Just thank you for letting me ramble and try <laughs> put together some cohesion in what I'm trying to communicate. I loved it. I thought it was great. And I'm really excited that we now can add Pentecostal to the list. So I appreciate that. (laughs) If you want to follow Liz, definitely go check out her TikTok at Liz the Former, where she goes into more detail about her experience in the JMS cult and on Instagram as well at Liz the Former. And we will put all of her links in the description box below. Thank you. And for everyone watching, thank you for making it this far. It means a lot. Your support means a lot liking and sharing helps us tremendously um, subscribing as well of course and if you want to support even further you can become a patron at patreon.com slash cults to consciousness thank you so much to our newest patrons emily and patty it's so awesome that you're willing to support in that way and i really appreciate it so guys if you want to watch liz's previous video i'll link it here along with another one that you may want to check out and until next time follow your highest excitement be conscious and be well